This talk will be an introductory overview of the Chow ring in algebraic geometry. So what the Chow ring is, is the following. You take a non-singular variety V and we form a ring which is denoted by A of V or sometimes by CH of V. And the idea is the elements of the ring are something to do with subvarieties of V and the product of two elements is going to be something to do with the intersection of two subvarieties. Um, well there are several problems in um, making sense of this and I'll try to explain what the problems are and how you fix them. So first of all if we've got this ring whose elements are subvarieties it ought to be graded a i of v, where this has something to do with subvarieties of codimension i. And it's graded by codimension because if you take the intersection of two things of dimension codimension i and codimension j, the intersection should usually have codimension i plus j, although it sometimes doesn't, and this is one of the complications we have to deal with. So the first attempt might be to define z i of v to be the cycles of v, the codimension i cycles. So the cycles of codimension i are just the free abelian group generated by um, closed codimension i subvarieties. Um, and the idea is to define, try and define a product on z i of v by defining y intersection z to be the sum over w of some intersection number y z w times w. So this is a sort of provisional attempt at defining the product. So this is a sum over um, codimension i plus j components of y intersection z and this is going to be some sort of intersection number telling you the multiplicity of the intersection of y and z at the component w. So the first problem is how do we define this intersection number? So let's ask how do we define i, y, z W. So the picture you might have is something like this. So here's V and Y might look like this and Z might look like this. And you see uh, in this particular example um, the intersection is going to have two components. It might have a component W1 and here a component W2. And at the component W1 it looks plausible that the intersection number should be 1. And here the two y and z are sort of touching to order 2, so the intersection number ought to be 2. And um, y intersection z should be something like 1 times W1 plus 2 times W2. So um, how do we define this intersection number? Well, there's an obvious way to do it. Let's take A to be the local ring of V at the um, irreducible component W. Then Y and Z just correspond to ideals um, A and B of, um, uh, of the local ring. And W, which corresponds to Y intersection V, um, should correspond to A modulo the ideal generated by A and B. So it means Y is sort of corresponding to A modulo the ideal A and Z to A modulo the ideal B. So this um, uh, corresponds to the scheme theoretic intersection. So um, this um, 
might have nilpotent elements. So if it didn't have nilpotent elements, which happens in a case like this, then, then it's just the coordinate ring of the variety W. But in general, in, in a case like this element hit, like this intersection here, um, this ring will generally have nilpotent elements. So, so, but you can still think of it as the coordinate ring of a scheme. Um, and um, we can just look at the length of A modulo AB and ask, is this equal to the intersection number of Y and Z along W? Um, and in many cases, this works quite well. So suppose we just take y to be, um, say, a parabola, y equals x squared, and we take z to be the x-axis, um, y equals 0. Then um, the ring, we, we want to work in the local ring, uh, kxy sort of localised at 0. I should have said we're taking v to be the affine plane here, of course. Um, um, so the ideal a is going to be y minus x squared, and the ideal b is going to be the ideal y. So we look at kxy0 modulo the ideal generated by y minus x squared and y, and this is just isomorphic to k of x modulo x squared, and the length is obviously equal to 2, and 2 is a very reasonable number for the intersection multiplicity of these two subvarieties. So that works just fine. Um, however, it sometimes fails. So here's an example where, where, where it fails. Here we take y to be the union of two two planes in four-dimensional affine space. So you can picture y as being a two-plane there and a, another two-plane here, and they just meet at a point because we're working in four-dimensional space, not three-dimensional space. They don't intersection, intersect along a line. And we're just going to take z to be another plane through this point 0, 0, 0, 0. So they're going to intersect it one particular point. So for example, y that the two planes might be x equals y equals 0 and z equals w equals 0. And this plane might be, say, x equals z, y equals w, just taking the simplest way you can get three planes through there. And here we're taking the point w to be 0, 0, 0, 0, and v to be a to the 4, of course. And the intersection multiplicity of y and z along w really ought to be 2, because um, z intersects each of these two planes of y in one point, so it ought to intersect y in two points. So we should really have this. On the other hand, if we try and work out the um, length of this local ring, well, we, we look at the ideal of y, which is given by xz equals x w equals yz equals yw equals 0. And the ideal of z is obviously given by these. So we should look at the ring k x y z w modulo x z x w y z y w x minus z y minus w. So here we have the ideal of giving this us the um, algebraic subset y, and this comes from algebraic subset z, and this is isomorphic to k x y localized at zero modulo x squared x y y squared, and the length of this um, is equal to three, and you notice that three is not equal to 2, so our definition of intersection multiplicity just gives the wrong answer for this case. And you notice there's absolutely nothing pathological or weird about this case. We're just looking at you know, intersections of hyperplanes in affine space. You couldn't get anything simpler, and it's already failing for this case. Um, well, there are several ways of fixing it, and the neatest one is due to Serre. 
who, who found the following definition for the intersection multiplicity of y and z along w. Um, all you do is you take a to be the local ring um, of v along w as before, and you just take this to be the sum over all i of minus 1 to the i of the length of tor i of a of a over a a over b. So these are both modules over the local ring a and you can just take take the torsion. Okay well so how is this relation to the previous definition? Well if we take i equals zero we're just getting tor zero of a a over a a over b which is just a over a tensor over a with a over b which is just a modulo a b which is our previous definition of the intersection multiplicity. So what is going on is the the first term of Sayre's formula or maybe the zeroth term is just our old definition of the intersection multiplicity and then you have to add correction terms um, coming from these various higher tors which are happen to be zero in simple cases but are non-zero in more complicated cases. And this turns out to give a really nice definition of intersection multiplicity. Um, for instance it's always non-negative uh, which isn't entirely obvious because some of the terms in this formula are actually negative. Well there's a, another problem that we've been <coughs> a bit quiet about that we'd better comment on now which is what if y intersection z has components of co-dimension less than co-dimension y plus co-dimension z. So generically the intersection of y and z its components will have co-dimension equal to the sum of these co-dimensions and in that case Sayre's formula works just fine and um, we have no problems. However, sometimes um, it has the wrong co-dimension. For example, we could just take y equal to z and then it definitely has the wrong co-dimension. Um, so let's look at a simple example of this. Let's just take v to be the projective plane and we can just take y to be a line and z is also a line. So z looks like that and the intersection ought to be a point but it isn't a point it's an entire line so what can we do? Well we can what we can do is we can deform z slightly to form an, a new line z dash so so we just perturb z to get z dash and we take z dash intersection y and there's a problem with this Rather obvious problem y intersection z dash depends on the choice of z. Um, you see the, the intersection is going to be some point on y but the point on y will depend on how we move z off y and there's no way to choose a canonical point because the automorphism group of p2 acts transitively on all points of y so we're just stuck with the fact that the intersection even if we define it, it's going to be a bit ambiguous. So the problem is that y intersection z um, is only defined up to some equivalence relation. So we want to say for example that all points on y are going to be equivalent and represent the same element of the Chow ring. Um, so what is this equivalence relation? Well, um, the equivalence relation turns out to be rational equivalence of cycles. So what do we do for this? Well, we say two cycles of dimension j are equivalent if, um, let's call these cycles z1, z2, if c1 minus c2 is equal to f, the, 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 the zeros of f for f is a rational function 
on some sub variety of dimension j plus 1. Well, this isn't actually an equivalence relation, so we have to take the equivalence relation um, generated by these. Um, so, um, uh, and what Chow showed uh, is that given cycles y and z, we can find z dash um, equivalent to z, so that y intersection z dash is well defined. In other words, its components have the right co-dimension. And furthermore, um, y intersection z dash is equivalent to y intersection z double, double dash whenever z dash is equivalent to z double dash. So the result of this is that we get a well-defined ring Um, so we get a well-defined ring called the Chow ring on equivalence classes of cycles. So it's these equivalence classes that are going to be the, um, the um, modules A, I of V. Um, actually, um, this is actually a little bit subtle. Um, so let's illustrate Chow's um, theorem or lemma by taking S to be, say, some surface P2 um, blown up at a point. So we have um, a little copy of P1 on this blown up surface, which is the exceptional curve, um, usually denoted by E. And suppose we try working out the intersection number of E with itself. Well, first of all, we have to start by moving E. We, we have to move E slightly to some other curve, E prime. And the problem is you can't do this. Um, if you remember from the discussion of exceptional curves, you, you can't actually deform exceptional curves. They're sort of rigid. So this seems to be a counterexample to Chow's moving lemma. Um, well, it's not because you can do you actually do something a little bit subtle. Suppose we take a line A in P two, and um, if we move it so that it passes through the point we bl we blew up, then it becomes the union of two curves B and E, and this is a rational equivalence. So we find A is equivalent to B union E. Um, and now you see this means that E is going to be equivalent to A minus B. And now A minus B has a well-defined intersection with E because A doesn't even meet E and B meets E transversely. So A minus B intersection E is well-defined. And you see what has happened is that we've deformed E not to a curve but to a cycle with negative coefficients. Um, and in, in fact, um, whenever we deform E to something that has a well-behaved intersection number with E, we have to have something with negative coefficients. And that's because the intersection number of E with itself is equal to minus one um, times a point in some sense. And you, you, um, the fact that the self-intersection number of E is negative means that you have to have negative signs turning up somewhere when you deform E into a, into a well-behaved cycle. Um, so Chow's moving lemma doesn't say you can deform sub-varieties, it says you can deform cycles. Um, and even if you start with a cycle with positive coefficients, its deformation might pick up negative coefficients. Um, so there's one uh, minor point that I haven't emphasised, which is that V should be non-singular. 
And what happens if V is singular? Well, then you definitely get some extra complications. And I'll just um, illustrate what can go wrong, or, well, not really wrong, but uh, illustrate one of these extra complications by just taking V to be a cone with a singular point at the origin. And now suppose I take um, some sort of conic section on this, so it's going to be some sort of hyperbola, and let, let's call this A. And let's take a line B. And you notice that um, A intersection B is just a point. It's just this point here. There's, there's no problem at all. And now let's um, slide A down or move A around so that it, so that it becomes um, a line here, except that if you slide A around so it becomes a line, it doesn't actually become a line, it becomes a double line. So it might be um, 2 times C, where C is a single copy of this line here. So, um, so um, 2C intersection B should also be a point up to equivalence, but this means C intersection B should be half a point. Well, that's not really that much of a problem. It does mean that instead of working with cycles with integer coefficients, you need to work with cycles with rational coefficients on this particular non-singular variety. So you can get a sort of intersection on sing on, on varieties with singularities, but you definitely do get extra complications turning up. Um, well, we should um, give some examples of what Chow rings are. So, so um, the problem with the Chow ring A of V is in general very hard to calculate. Um, well, we can sometimes calculate a few bits of it. So this is going to be the sum of a i of v. And a naught of v is easy. It's just equal to z. And it's generated by the whole variety v, which is the, which, which is the um, identity element of, of the Chow ring. Because if you intersect anything with the whole space v, you just get the thing you started with. a1 of v which is the co-dimension 1, is also not too difficult to describe. This turns out to be, it's just um, hyper surfaces, modulo linear equivalence. And the, this thing generated by hyper surfaces are more or less divisors. So what we've got are divisors up to linear equivalence, and this is more or less the Picard group of V. Um, and already you notice this can be rather big. For instance, if V is an elliptic curve, then the Picard group of V is actually an uncountable abelian group. Um, so except in very special cases, the um, Chow groups um, are uncountable abelian groups, so they're very large. Um, there are some cases when um, the Picard group um, is, is, sorry, not the Picard group, the Chow group is much simpler. If we take V to be projective space, for example, we just find that A I of V is equal to Z for naught less than or equal to I less than or equal to N. Um, and the reason for this is that um, any co-dimension sub-variety of V turns out to be linearly equivalent to um, a finite union of hyperpla of, of, um, of uh, linear subspaces. A number of linear subspaces are just the degree of the variety. Um, the reason why projective space has a Chow group that's so easy is that P to the N is paved by affine spaces in some sense. What this means is we can write p to the n as a very nice well-behaved union of affine spaces. So, so remember p to the n can be just be written as a point union, a line, a1, union, a plane, 
a2 and so on. Um, and it turns out that the point and the line and the plane, or rather their closures, actually form a basis for the Chow ring. And the same thing happens for any variety that's, that you can write as a very nice union of affine spaces. For example, the same thing works for Grassmannians. Um, again, Grassmannians can be written as a somewhat more complicated union of affine spaces, and so we get the the, the chowering of Grassmannians is also easy to describe and has a basis of these affine spaces. Um, the intersection numbers of these affine spaces are quite complicated to work out. This is the um, famous Schubert calculus, and the coefficients are given by things called Littlewood Richardson coefficients, and the, 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 the sort of a semi infinite number of papers written about these. Um, okay, that will um, end the introduction to the Chow Ring. Um, the next lecture will be um, a few basic properties of the Chow Ring and a few applications of it. For example, um, we'll show how you can define churn classes of vector bundles taking values in the Chow Ring.